Welcome everybody, Scott Choppin joining you from Long Beach, California. Welcome to our weekly Saturday market update where we'll talk about the multifamily market specifically. We'll help you be a better investor and we're gonna bring you information about the multifamily markets, about general economic trends, uh, the latest and greatest from all the reading that, that we do, that I do every week, several articles a day. Uh, you know, we're signed up for every e-blast e you could think of. We're reading books, you know, every week. And we're gonna uh, bring that to you on a Saturday. We're gonna be a little less formal. And, but uh, we wanna be an offer of, of knowledge and help to you so that you can make better investment decisions. So here we go. First thing we're gonna cover today, uh, today is Saturday, 10, 10, 20, so October 10th, 2020. Um, we're, gonna two, we're gonna cover two things today. First, we're gonna cover uh, very briefly the uh, latest rent payment tracker info from National Multi-Housing Council, which is uh, something that's like was recently created Really, I mean, maybe it existed before, but everybody started paying attention to it as of, you know, March and April 2020, when the question of, you know, the capability of tenants to pay uh, their rents timely and fully related to the employment, you know, disruption from the coronavirus era. So this has been a tool that uh, has, has really come into the, you know, public domain in a major way. In fact, it's being covered and utilized by, you know, major, uh, you know, media outlets. Uh, we use it as a tool, just one of many of the tools that we use. As as many of you have heard me talk about before, I want to use really the broadest set of tools. These are websites. These are economic tracking um, companies, you know, market study companies, uh, economists, writers that are like sophisticated in their you know, uh, understanding of economics, like Bill McBride at, at, at Calculated Risk is one that you guys have heard me talk about before. So uh, basically what we have here is, is the, you know, rent track, rent payment tracker for any of you have not, not seen it, you know, go to NM, nmhc.org uh, or just like uh, NMHC rent tracker in Google and you'll find it. But basically, as you can see here, basically for this uh, period right now, we're at 79.4% um, collections as of October 6th. And one of the things to, to keep track of is that the rent tracker payment uh, uh, has a couple different time periods that it reports in. The ones that we really track are the, the, the 6th, which for most landlords would be you're late by the 5th or late after the 5th, depending on the lease language that you have. And that's how we do it. And so that sixth date, sort of like this would be the first day that you're late and really an important one. And if we go down here further, let's see here. It basically says, you know, we, um, uh, so this is unchanged from the share that was paid through September, 2020. Let's highlight this here. Okay, this is unchanged from the share who paid rent through October 6, 2019. So what we're saying is that the rent payment at 79.4 exactly matches or is very similar to October of 2019. So a year over year, October to October, we're matching. And that's interesting to me. We'll, we'll, we'll show some graphs here a little later that shows some sort of the years uh, and months graphed uh, relative to each other. And then it basically says in compare 76.4% that has paid in September 6, 2020. So that's the last month versus this month, which at least in my opinion, uh, amongst the 11.4 million units professionally managed that are the database for this rent tracker, like I, I'm I'm relatively uh, pleased with that, right? Like we're, we're, you know, last month people were talking about, hey, we're going to continue to trend down. Um, stimulus money for the federal $600 a week uh, unemployment had, has ceased. You know, we're in California and California is trying to supplement the normal unemployment. But, you know, really in a story right now where new stimulus hasn't been forthcoming, uh, we're still under some different versions of eviction moratorium, but that we're relatively stable in, ter in you know, context of the coronavirus you know, disruption to the economy, you know, we're in relatively good shape. I would, uh, that's my opinion about it. Now, of course, we need to be vigilant. Um, you know, we're not seeing here going, ah, oh, it's all good. We're, we're, we're good forever. It's not, we need to be looking really for what I call second and third order effects, right? So we've got employment disruption. We've got stimulus money coming into it. We had unemployment, $600 a week, federal plus the state, which was, you know, California was making some people more money than than when they were employed. 
So there's these, you know, consequences from the stimulus, from the unemployment, um, from the employment disruption. And then we're going to be looking for second order, which is consequences of the consequences, right? So right now, let's look at this one. This is rent payment tracker. These are weekly results. So you can see here, um, basically, this is, uh, this is 2020 right here. Um, and you can see that it's, it's lower generally than, so here we have, you know, we have the 2019 data and then we have now the 2020 data. So you can see relative from, um, you know, month to month, we're lower generally, but, you know, we're relatively stable with more volatility is what I would say. So there's that. So there's the month to month and, and they'll give you these data. And of course, this is October is as, and in fact, they specify it here. It says week ending sixth. And then, uh, in fact, all these are week ending sixth. So this is month to month, year to year, compared on the sixth, the collection date of the sixth. In fact, it specifies it down here. Okay. So now we got the rent payment tracker and these are the full month results. And the way they do it is really cool. So the, here at the bottom, you know, you've got this sixth. You got the 13th, you got the 20th, 27th, and the end of the month. And so you can get a total monthly picture view here, which I really like. Um, and you can really see, uh, I do see a longer term trend here, right? 96, 96, 95 in, in 2019. And then we got 95. Now they're going from May to May. So we're not seeing January 2019 to January 2020, but that would that's makes sense because we're really not like that was pre-coronavirus. So, you know, although those statistics exist, that's like not what's relevant to the disruption, right? We're looking, May is when the disruption was starting to show up in the rental markets, right? And so you can see this is starting to trend down. So we're at 94.6, but so like September to September, it's 95.5, 94.6, right? Um, and that's for the total month's payment. Um, so I, I think, you know, we're generally seeing a, a, trending downwards in 2020 which has us that's why we're vigilant so month to month we're we're doing good you know as of the six so that's the six to the six you know we're matching last year's um but that doesn't you know take into account the rest of the month's payments that were late but still were ultimately paid right so i think that's all i'm going to show you for uh nmhc rent tracker uh, but I would definitely suggest you guys go there. Uh, it's a great tool to see. Now, obviously, it's limited to the 11.4 million units of those members that are in National Multi Housing Council. So it certainly is not a totality of the marketplace. And it certainly leaves out a lot of mom and pop rental housing. So small communities, small apartment, you know, assets that aren't going to show up here. And I'm sure there's other like, you know, local, you know, in California, got the California Apartment Association. They, to my knowledge, don't have any rent tracking information. So it becomes much more anecdotal. Uh, I know just in sharing with people that uh, now own our UTH projects that we sold in the early years of that program. I mean, they're at 99 percent collection so that we're seeing good data here. Um, anecdotally, just other owners that I know in the local market here in Southern California are generally having decent rent collection, probably a little bit more vacancy than they would have typically seen in, in a normal market. But in 2019 and early 2020, I mean, we're at peak market, guys. So we were going to expect to see high rents, high rent growth, low, uh, high, high occupancy and low vacancy. So that would be the peak of the market and not really what we can compare to now that we're into October 2020. And I'll finish with guys like Ken McElroy. Uh, if you look him up on YouTube, a um, couple other YouTube folks that I listen to that are sort of in the space of, uh, you know, real estate, multifamily ownership, multifamily development are sort of anticipating that 2021 will be where the majority of the stress starts to show up really where the second and third order effects that I talked about, you know, consequences on consequences will start to show up. We'll see some of the, you know, the eviction moratoriums burn off and we'll start to see, you know, some of these, um, you know, forbearance structures with lenders for, uh, you know, for homeowners and, and mortgage debt holders start to, to burn off. Uh, and, and also those multifamily owners that are in forbearance for their multifamily loans, right? So 2021 seems to be the key year. Uh, some people are talking Q2, Q3 of 2021 as the really what we need to be vigilant for to look for the second, third or effects to really take place. All right, now we're going to get to our second 
uh, part of this Saturday market update. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, sticking with us. Um, we talked about the National Multi-Housing Council rent tracker. And the second part of this update, I want to um, talk about CB Richard Ellis, CBRE's U.S. cap rate survey. Um, they do, in this case, they call it a special report for uh, third quarter of 2020. So uh, basically, I get this via email. I would recommend everybody, you know, anybody who's listening to this is probably already, you know, like signing up for these kind of things. But you know, we very rigorously sign up for every survey economic update that we can. Um, we're probably, you know, tracking close to 50 uh, that we get in any month. And, and, you know, sometimes they're monthly, sometimes they're quarterly, depends. And there's like just a handful that we really focus on. Uh, but I was like what uh, CB Richard Ellis has to, to say, and particularly this cap rate survey is always interesting to me to see where the market's going. So we're, we're again, finding ourselves in October of 2020. So we're really, you know, reporting a third quarter um, and we're going to be focused on the multifamily markets in and around Southern California and California generally. So, all right, we're going to start on the on the first page. So one, I just have to commend CB Richard Ellis. I mean, it's a great, great web looking website, but, you know, it's CBRA, what, what do you expect? So they have two things here. They have this, uh, you can see down here, this um, the, the cap rate survey itself. And then they have this uh, cap rate analyzer, which is very cool. And I'm actually gonna show you a couple different parts of this to give you a little bit of a synopsis. Here you can see suburban multifamily had the most uh, markets, 36 reporting cap rate decreases. Okay, so that's value increase, cap rate decrease. Um, obviously it's suburban, which is part of what we're hearing today of this suburban and urban marketplace, um, you, you know, situation. So uh, just highlighted a couple of things here. Really the main message that uh, Spencer Levy, he's the chairman of their research division and, you know, somebody who, you know, anybody who's in the business has, has, has followed what, what Spencer says. Um, basically their, their uh, assessment is cap rates remain su surprisingly stable. So that's the overarching, you know, message that they're conveying here. So I'm going to switch here to this next one, which is basically his sort of written blog post format, uh, for what it is. And I've, I've made a few highlights here, but again, cap rates remain surprisingly stable. And then just a few highlights in here that you can see in the highlighted areas in this, uh, this, this green and, and pink areas. So, one, first he says the bad news, the COVID-19 era is that at least two or three of these factors, which he talks about above here, these got three factors, three basic components. In fact, I'll highlight it here. Um, three basic components of commercial real estate value. I and mean, everybody's going to know this cap rate, current net operating income and projected NOI. But he's referencing two of these will be affected. Current and projected NOI are at risk causing a positive investment activity for most commercial real estate assets. So obviously anybody who's listening to this is going to know that retail and hotel, anything related to the you know general retail environment, um, you know, in person, real life, not online is suffering restaurants, you know, commercial tourism, you know, Vegas and places like Vegas are being hit hard. Now I'm not here to talk about that kind of stuff. We're just an observer of the marketplace like, like you all are. Um, but part of our value is to highlight that what we're seeing in research reports, you know, this is stuff that we're reading and my ethic is to share that out to, you know, to the investment community. He says here though, further in this, in this pink highlight, the good news is that cap rates have remained relatively stable. Uh, CBRE's just released cap rate survey special report shows that cap rates for most industrial multifamily and office off, uh, assets have remained at pre-COVID levels and have gone down for the best assets, particularly industrial. Now, what he doesn't say here is that that, that uh, cap rates have gone down also for multifamily, although I showed that, that to you a second ago, at least in their assessment of the suburban markets. Um, then he goes on to say, how is cap rate stability possible in such a fluid environment, right? And that's really the main question that we're asking ourselves these days is, what is the future entail for cap rate adjustments in multifamily? Like that's the probably one of the most important questions that we're asking ourselves today. As many of you know, from our own investments and our own development projects, we're in this workforce housing space, a model called UTH. And that basically has a relatively stable multi-earner, strong social network tenant profile, which means that generally we're seeing stability in the renter marketplace, both in collections as well as uh, new lease rents and new lease velocities, we're seeing 
good strength there. So then the question, the next question we start to say is what evaluations, how are those going to be impacted? And, you know, of course, future collections under the eviction moratoriums that are happening in many places. Um, but in relative terms, you know, we're at 99% collections on, on past deals that we've sold that we, that we stay in touch with the owners and then our own leasing velocities and collections and our new properties are at, you know, exceptionally high levels and, and good leasing rates. So we're in this story of now what are rates, uh, cap rates and valuations going to do. He goes on further to say in this paragraph, you know, one reason for this cap rate stability is that investment volumes are extremely low. So that's one of the things we need to anticipate is that volumes of investment sales have dropped off. So the stability is based on a lot lower transaction volume. And we need to be vigilant about that, right? We need to make sure that we're not like, you know, making big bets based on, you know, not enough information. I mean, there's some information, but of course, there's not the level of information that we had in January 2020, at least for cap rate surveys and valuations, right? Um, you know, it's extremely low. He says extremely low due to a decided mismatch in buyer and seller expectations. So this is interesting to me. He says some 84% of Seabury's cap rate survey respondents say that sellers are unwilling to offer discounts while 61% of buyers expect them. So we have a mismatch in um, you know, what is happening in the marketplace between buyers and sellers, right? Like big surprise. Uh, we're seeing in that a little less so in the land markets. I will tell you, we're, we're seeing some capitulation on the, on the land market side, which is, you know, in the development business, you know, my joke is land sellers are always the last to get the news that a market is turned down and, you know, always first to get on board when they think the market's gone up. And sort of now what I say today is land sellers think the market's up all the time. And, you know, if anybody who owns land out there, I'm not trying to, you know, be a, be a harsh on folks. But the reality is when land owners who have owned land, particularly for a long time, they have usually emotionally invested. It's maybe in many cases, the, the sole asset of a, an estate or ownership. And so it has people hang on to the, you know, the emotional and long-term value of it. Um, it's hard to be a seller, I tell people, and we've done it, you know, several times ourselves. So he says uh, here in this green highlight, while investment volume remains subdued, the number of signed confidentiality agreements has risen sharply. This demonstrates that equity capital markets are deep and liquid, which will counteract much of the broader market risk and volatility. Now, anecdotally, we're seeing this, we're, we're seeing you know, strong continued interest in particularly the multifamily marketplace because investors are perceiving that while multifamily not as strong as industrial, it is, you know, like I put it in sort of second, you know, position for relative strength. Of course, each market's going to be differentiated geographically, you know, Midwest, East Coast, West Coast markets will perform differently. But I know in our own marketplace of Southern California, um, and particularly in the leasing and, and activity and rental rates that we're producing in our own projects, we see general stability. Now we are a product where people will move out of a studio into our multi-bedroom product type, which is UTH was a five bedroom, four bath product. We're the place where people go when they have employment changes or they need to you know, get together with family members or roommates to, to do what we call the economic sharing model. So I, I don't say we're, our experience is typical. Also what we're seeing both, both published and anecdotally is that the biggest uh, rent declines and velocity reductions in leasing activities is on your Class A uh, podium, downtown Long Beach, downtown LA, Irvine Business Center, Platinum Triangle, Warner Center, uh, that all those markets that have really the highest rent per square foot studio and one bedroom product are suffering the most declines in rents. Uh, in some markets, we're seeing between four and 6%, um, you know, uh, declines in rents. Now, one of the things to anticipate is that as rents decline now or over, over the last few months and with low investment sales volumes, that we should anticipate that there will be some change potentially in valuations of multifamily assets on a go forward basis. This survey that I'm going to show you here today does not show that yet, but we could be in a story to anticipate that. And again, differentiating between A, B, and C class assets, right? Each are going to be differently impacted now and in the midterm and in the long term. And so we should be vigilant about that, um, you know, amongst those, you know, relative valuation changes amongst those markets, particularly as people shift from A, you know, to B and C, right? That's, you know, sort of part of what we're seeing 
in the marketplace. And Ivy Zellman is, is somebody who you guys track and they had a great interview on Walker Dunlop's, uh, you know, monthly podcast. And she was really very bullish on the, on the B and C class workforce housing asset and the multifamily space as a, a place of refuge for people who are moving out of a product. And so far we're seeing that uh, show up in the in the rental rate changes in A, B, and C product in Southern California. So I think that's it. I would encourage you guys to go take a look at this. Um, this is great information. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is what they call this cap rate analyzer. Um, and this is just cool stuff. Let me refresh this so you can guys can kind of sort of see as this thing pops up. Beautiful website, by the way. Just killer. All right. So we're going to go to this map here. Um, which is super cool. This is the coolest thing. Uh, this is the first time I've seen it this way. And maybe they, they've done this in the past and I just didn't see it, but uh, happy to share this with you. You can see on the left that they've got multiple markets. And in fact, SoCal, they give several here. You can see um, Inland Empire, LA and Orange County. So I'm going to I'm gonna go to Los Angeles right now. And you'll see we zoom in here. Pretty cool stuff. Love, love this. And just give you a highlight here. Obviously, they're giving you all product types, but you can see here in the, the multifamily. Let's see if I can just highlight that one by itself. So you can see multifamily here. Um, basically, we got uh, four to four and a half for uh, infill multifamily stabilized class A. Now, again, we're talking class A, so we could say differentiated. Now, again, I'm speculating that we're going to see cap rate changes in class A product because we're seeing least published data that I am tracking, the most decline in rents in class A and the lowering of leasing velocities in class A. But you can see this little symbol here, these two little uh, gray triangles, that means basically it's it's stable right here. You can see over here under office, actually cap rates are going upwards, retail are going upwards, which is what you would expect in office and retail in this environment of October, 2020, right? We'd expect uh, office and retail assets to decline in value um, uh, cap rates going up and, and values declining, inversely related. But we're really focused on this uh, on this multifamily. Lower here, you see suburban multifamily, four point two five to five. Now our assets, just you know, for a feel, is we're generally urban infill um, in B and C neighborhoods. So the the way I describe it is, we're an UTH is an A product in a B and C neighborhood, right? So. We don't fit either either category A, B, or C, you know, in the in the traditional manner, um, and you know our product underwrites a little bit differently. But these are the sort of cap rates that we're we're looking at in the markets that we're actively developing, and particularly as we get into the refi story on our Fullerton project, we're going to have a in fact CBRE's Capital Markets Group is helping us with a Freddie Mac structure on the on the perm loan funding for that as soon as we get to, up to our occupancy rates for that. Um, and these are the sort of cap rate valuations that we're looking for and have, you know, sort of confirmed so far in our research. So that's for LA. Now let's go back one and let's look at Orange County. Um, and actually one of the cool things to do is you can, you can zoom in here. Um, so I'm going to show you LA, Orange County. So this is Orange County right here. And you can see that, uh, you know, it's relatively similar to L.A., four to four and a half on infill, which is exactly the same as it was in L.A., and then four to four and three quarters on suburban, which is actually lower cap rates, higher values than what we saw in the Los Angeles market. And then let me go to San Diego. Um, and I think what I'm going to we looked at this before and San Diego is actually doing relatively well. Now, I will say something about San Diego and we're not active in San Diego yet, but we're actually exploring moving into San Diego um, with our UTH model. There's a good story for middle income families that need new housing in these, uh, you know, these sort of major metro areas. We're active in L.A. and Orange counties, but want to move to San Diego next. Uh, actually, San Diego has had good uh, performance on rent levels. Right. So relatively stable. And in fact, in some uh, micro markets in San Diego, they're actually seeing rent increases. And then that sort of shows up here in the valuations here. You got four to four and a half on infill multifamily, which is exactly like LA and Orange County. Um, and then interestingly enough, suburban is four to four and a quarter, which is the lowest cap rate of the three that we've looked at today. Um, so that's notable. San Diego seems to be relatively strong. I don't have an assessment as to why that is. Although anecdotally, as I talk to people in the marketplace, the stability of the 
sort of the Navy facilities in San Diego lend, you know, general long-term stability to that marketplace. So that's the complete, um, you know, cap rate survey. I would encourage you guys to go look at that. I, I will continue to share out into the marketplace information that we see uh, amongst, you know, CBRE, Yardi, RCL Co., Walker Dunlop, when we get information from their uh, monthly webcast. Um, you know, we just look at every data source we can uh, find. I would encourage you guys to go look at Calculated Risk Blog. Bill McBride is the guy who writes that. Um, go to the econpi.com website and look at their bar grid analysis, which is a good tracking tool that we suggest to people to look at. And in fact, if you go to our website um, and sign up for our e-blast, uh, you'll get a weekly update in one of several of these economic tracking tools. And then we publish the bar grid analysis update on a weekly basis on our um, on our blog under the news section on our website. Um, so go to our website, hit the red sign up button, get on our Saturday e-blast, uh, go to our U YouTube channel under urbanpacific.com, um, kindly subscribe. We're, we're putting out um, these sorts of uh, weekly updates um, on a regular basis and just looking to share value information out in the marketplace. And really it comes from the place that this is what we're looking at. This is what we're looking for our own business and that we just have the ethic, the standard of conduct to share it out in the marketplace to produce value for, you know, those in the marketplace and, and investors that are looking at the multifamily space specifically. So I'm Scott Choppin checking out from Long Beach. Uh, thanks so much.